Thank you, Brother Dalton, for singing this morning. I'm so thankful for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, aren't you? Boy, we can make a lot of mistakes. I'm so thankful that his grace is greater than my sin and than your sin. I'm glad you're here this morning, and I want you to know above everything else that God loves you and Jesus died for you. No matter how broken you may feel you are, no matter how messed up you may think you are, Jesus Christ can take those pieces and he can make something new again. He can take a broken, messed up life, he can save it and transform it. And that's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why we're here today. We're here to worship that God this morning. Give your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, please. Hebrews chapter 11. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 is the chapter on faith. We began there last week. I want to look at that same passage this morning and this evening with the grace of the Lord in that. Why are you here this morning? Why are you here this morning? Well, I'm here because my wife dragged me here. Get to church or the pastor, you've got to preach this morning. You're here because, boy, someone will think bad of me if I'm not here. You're here because maybe you're at a point in life where it feels hopeless. Maybe you're here because, boy, I go to church. It's what I do on Sundays. This morning, I want to challenge us on a true faith in God. We come to church for a variety of reasons. We miss church for a variety of excuses. There's only one reason we ought to come to church, and that's for God himself. Now, God will use you for other people. Listen, when you're at church... You may not be just at church just to hear the preaching, though God exalts the preaching, not the preacher, but the preaching, the truth of, of, God, of the Word of God. And at First Baptist Church, we have the truth that God shared. You understand the church is, is all of this, the people of church, too. That's the church. You're here to encourage one another to pray, to worship, and to praise. That's why you're here at church today. But you ought to be here at church overall for Him, for Him. This year, the theme is only God and what I have discovered, what I've found, is that many people have as many views of God. Someone a lot smarter than me, and that doesn't take much, has said that we often gain many of our views of God from the view of our Father, or the Father figure in our life. Unknowingly, subconsciously, we will begin to view God through that lens rather than the lens of how he has revealed himself to us through God's word. There are some that view God as nothing more than a tyrant. Nothing more, God, that there's some that view God that he is nothing more than someone who sits up in the heavens waiting for anyone to make the slightest mistake so he can bop them on the head. Kind of like the whack-a-mole game. I see that Christian messing up, bop him on the head. This one pops up, and I bop them. And there are some people who view God to be nothing more than a tyrant who just waits for us to make one little mistake, one little slip up, and boom, he gets us. Often that is because perhaps that is how their father interacted with them. I wish that all fathers gave the right view, the right example of God. But fathers were flesh and blood. No excuse, just reality. I've heard some terrible stories about fathers, ones I want to re repeat all of them. I remember one that has stuck with me for years about a father at Christmas time who would wrap all these presents for his children, have them open them, and then before they could play with them, would put on his big work boots and smash the gifts. Would it surprise you to know that those children were in counseling? Terrible things. This morning, I want to hopefully give you some aspects of God that will strengthen your faith in God. There are some who view God to be nothing more than a grandfatherly figure in their life. Grandfathers are wonderful. I was able and privileged to know one of my grandfathers. One passed away before I was born. My other grandfather passed away a little over a year and a half ago. And I still miss him. He was a mentor in my life. I would call him for advice. He was wonderful. He, he loved technology. But he wasn't really good with technology. And he was not 
insecure in life financially. And so when something of his technology did not work, he would not try to fix it. He would just buy something new and put that in the closet. I like technology as well. I said, Grandpa, I'll take that. I wonder, I wonder if I can fix it. And he would say, well, J.D., I'd hate to give you something broken. Oh, that's okay, Grandpa. <laughs> Remember one time he gave me a, a device that was worth it, and I was in college, over about, about $500 or $600. He said, this thing is broken. It's a piece of junk. I said, Grandpa, would you ship it to me? He mailed it to me from Puerto Rico. I got it, and I performed quite the feat on it. I took a paper clip and hit the reset button on the back of it. <laughs> Worked until I sold it just fine. But he was much more than a technology best buy depot for me. He was a wonderful man. And, but grandfathers, they typically just often pamper and spoil, do they not? And they brag on you. And I can't remember my grandfather ever really getting on me too much. Always supporting, always just saying, oh, this is, this is great. And some people view that's the way of God. God's just sitting up there just to pat you on the head and send you a nice new shiny piece. But are not careful, we'll have false views of God. Look, please, in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1. Now faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. And here's our text for this morning, verse number 6. Would you read it with me this morning? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I pray you'd help me, Lord, to say those things that would help us according to your word. Lord, would you touch us this morning? Would you show us yourself? Lord, if there's areas in our life that are displeasing, Lord, or don't, or don't reflect you the right way, Lord, would you touch us this morning? Would it maybe change for your honor and for your glory? Lord, I ask your help in this time. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory for it. Lord, bind the devil's demons. May there be no distractions in this service. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. This morning the Bible says, without faith... It is impossible. The world has changed over the last 25 years. Understatement of the day, most likely. Years ago, and I have not seen this, but, but I, I know this, there was a, a, a character that they called was Rambo. Or another character, Chuck Norris. These guys could take on unbelievable odds and win. I happen to enjoy Chuck Norris jokes. Chuck Norris, uh, he was a champion of something for a lot of times. I don't know all that stuff. But there's, there's jokes about how Chuck Norris doesn't do push-ups. He just pushes the world down. Makes me chuckle. I heard another one. Chuck Norris threw a grenade and killed nine soldiers. Then he pulled the pin. I heard with Chuck Norris, I heard Google's email address, google at chucknorris.com. Chuck Norris. And years ago, there was the idea, boy, we can take on the world. We can do it. You, you know, and they'll say, they'll say you can do it. You know, you can destroy and, and, and conquer everything. But, but we're not there these days. The world changed. Instead of taking on the universe and pushing down the world, now we can sit around and talk. We're one big happy family, a bunch of friends. No drive and no, uh, no push. And if we're not careful, we come into life thinking that God doesn't care what we do. 
And he doesn't care how we think about him. Understand something, that God does not live to serve me. I live to serve him. God does not live to serve me. I live to serve him. This morning, the Bible says that if I'm going to have true faith, this possible faith that appears impossible to please him, but it's made possible by faith, that I must believe that God is. And I want to talk about this morning three realities of God. Three realities of God this morning. We must live in the reality of God. God is not just some figure that Christians made up. God is a universal, wonderful, almighty creator who lives in the heavens. He's in charge of everything. He made you and I just like he made the worlds and he lives forever and ever forever God is a reality the reality of God there are three realities this morning as we believe that God is see sometimes we sit here and we say oh God is and we know it here but nothing changes in our life faith in this chapter faith in our life is always linked to some works Faith is always linked to something. You make decisions based upon faith. I want to give you three realities we must live in this morning. The first reality is this. The reality, living in the reality of the sovereignty of God. Now the word sovereignty is a big theological word. I'll help you break it down for you. When God, we believe that God is sovereign, we believe that he's in charge. There are some men who believe they're in charge in their house. And there are some men who might be in charge in their house. They're not always the ones who believe they're in charge. There are some ladies who believe they're in charge in their house. And there are some ladies who are in charge at their house. There are some children who believe they're in charge at their house. And help me here, there are some children who actually are in charge at their house. Can I get an amen out there? Have you been to Walmart lately? I want that, I want that, I want that. No, 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 I want that. No, 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 I want that. Here it is, shut up now. They figured out how to run their house. Boy, I tell you, I'm going to pause here real quick, Christian parents. Listen, don't let your kids run your house. Don't let your kids run your house. That's not the way God set it up. Now, I love my kids. I value their opinion sometimes. I value, I value um, their desires sometimes, occasionally. You know, on the, the, the third Sunday of the fifth month uh, in the 16th year of their life, okay. No, 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 I love my kids. I w- want them, to, but, but they're not in charge in my house. They're not in charge. They're not supposed to be in charge. I remember one time, I'm, I was school principal for 12 years here. I'm in the hallway, and I don't remember who it was. Praise the Lord, I know. There was some young person on the phone with their mother talking and speaking in a way that I wouldn't speak to any human being in this world. And just, I would say, ripping her face off. And then hung up on their mother. There are a few things I think that God has a real problem with. There's a few things that J.D. Howell has a real problem with. Hanging up on your mother, don't do that in front of me. I said to that kid, what are you doing? What are you doing? And mom, I guess, thought it was normal. There are some kids who think they're in charge. There are some kids who are in charge. There are some people, there are some people who think they're in charge of life. But there is no one who is in charge except for God himself. That's that word, sovereignty, living in the reality that God is in charge. Now, it's one thing to know it. It's one thing to think it, another matter entirely to live that way. We must believe that God is, that he is sovereign. He is in charge. He is the ultimate authority. What does that mean? Let me give you two, a few statements about that. When God is in charge, when I act like God is in charge, then I will obey, I will follow what he decrees. Well, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that if you say you have faith in God, and you don't do what God tells you to do, you're not showing your faith in God. 
Someone who has faith in God will obey what he decrees. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Paul in 2 Corinthians says this, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Throughout the entire chapter of chapter 11, we find men and we find women who not only believe that God is, but did what he said to do. He said to Abraham, Abraham, pack up your house, pack up your tent, pack up everyone around you and move. Lord, where are we going? I'll tell you when you get there. Now, I do that, but just to my kids. Where are we going? We're going crazy. They've learned that crazy with dad is a lot of fun. Maybe your kids are like mine. Dad, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? Dad, are we there yet? That'll drive you bonkers. You know what I say? Yes. Every time, yes. We can be Paul at the driveway. We're there yet, Dad? Yep, we're there. Oh, Dad, you're teasing. Yep. <laughs> Keep on asking. Yep. <laughs> But God said to Abraham, Abraham, pack it up. Abraham said, yes, sir, I will. He obeyed what God decreed. True faith follows God. Faith in God without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith obeys what he decrees. Boy, throughout this chapter, we see men and women. We see Moses, who was not wanting to go back to Egypt, but he followed the Lord. Moses made a lot of excuses. You can find that in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, when God showed up to him in the burning bush. Moses, Moses gave every excuse under the sun, to the point that God became angry with him. But eventually, Moses followed and went back. Sometimes we give excuses. Lord, I can't do that, and we've got good excuses. They make a lot of sense to us, but you can't fool the Almighty. He's in charge. He can see right through you. You see, in this chapter, we find men and women who not only believe God, but follow God. In this chapter, we see about the life of Joseph, who not only believed that God had a bigger plan, but he took steps and he followed God throughout that way. When he had a chance for vengeance and the chance to be bitter, he didn't. Instead, he forgave. When he had a chance to end up in some sin, he didn't. Instead, he followed God. You see, when God is in charge, I'm going to live that way and I will obey what he decrees. I wonder this morning, if we were to look at your life, if all you do is just lip service to God. You can say amen, you can sing the songs, but when God touches you, you don't obey. True faith follows. True faith follows. Sometimes that following looks like an apology. Sometimes that following says, Lord, you, 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 not, not my will, but thine be done. True faith, the reality of the sovereignty that God is in charge, I obey what he decrees. But number two, I'm okay, I'm content with what God decides. You know what I find in this life? That sometimes God brings things into people's lives that they don't understand. You ever been there before? You ever been in a situation that is there and you don't understand why God brought you to the spot? I think Joseph was there. Though he followed God, I, I can't help but wonder if there was a moment where he said, God, why am I here? Why would you sell me? You see, when I walk in the reality of God, believe that God is, I'm okay with what he decides. I'm okay with the fact, because he's in charge, that God can do anything that he wants to do. In this chapter, we learn about Enoch. The Bible tells us that Enoch was translated. He went right to heaven. We find out that Noah, with the flood, was liberated. Abraham was separated. Isaac was consecrated. Joseph was elevated. Israel was emancipated. And Rahab was liberated. But... That doesn't happen to everyone. If you have your Bibles open, Hebrews 11, would you look in verse 35, please? Where the Bible says, women receive their dead, raised to life again. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome to see today? Wouldn't that be great? You go at the funeral and, and grandma sits right up. That'd be awesome. That'd be incredible. Other women receive their dead, raised to life Boy, this is exciting. And then the verse goes on. And others were tortured. Others were tortured. Boy, it almost seemed like a, a huge contrast there. This lady received her son back to life, and this lady got tortured. Say, what? Let's keep reading. 
not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Were tempted. Were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. Read those verses. And if I had to choose... If I got to choose which ones I got to be in, I'd be in the first part of the verses. I'm just telling you about me, about my my, my flesh. If you said, listen, you're going to show faith in God, and you can either have amazing, miraculous, dead, raised back to life, or you can be tortured. Uh, Door number one, please. Door number one, that's the one I want. I'm just being honest this morning. right? Do you hear me this morning? But faith in God doesn't mean that, that I just have faith when things are going like I think they ought to go. Yeah. Well, when things seem to be good, faith in God says, no matter what happens in life, no matter what God brings in life, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with what he decides. And true faith, when you live in the reality that God is, you'll be okay with what God brings into your life. The Bible goes on, and these all These all, not just the ones that we think had it good or the ones that maybe had it bad. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better things for us that they without us should not be made perfect. These all, having obtained a good report through faith. And my friend, this morning, I don't know what your life holds, but I tell you right now, you can still walk in faith toward God. Whether things are way up here and and the miraculous things are happening, or whether you feel like those latter verses, where every step you turn seems to be bad, you can still walk by faith. And true faith follows God no matter what happens in life. I'm okay with what he decides. Charles Spurgeon said this, There is no attribute more comforting to the children of God than God's sovereignty, his control, he's in charge. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that God has ordained these things and that the Lord overrules them. There is nothing for which the children ought to more earnestly contend for than the fact that their master is master over all creation. When we look at this verse, we see we must believe that God is, and what is he? He is in charge of everything, and we must live life like he is in charge. That means doing what he says and being content with what he does. I want to give another another reality this morning. Not only must we live in the reality of his sovereignty, we must live in the reality of his strength. The reality of his strength. I wonder today if you're living in God's strength or your own strength. You see, when I live in my strength, I'm not walking by faith. I'm walking by my own strength. When I walk by faith, I live, I rest in the strength of God. I draw power from him. I I see his promises, his provision. I discover peace from him. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I wonder this morning if you're living in the strength of God. I read this morning my devotions in Jeremiah chapter 32 where the Bible says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Now, I love that question from Scripture where God says, I'm the God of everything. What's too hard? In the vernacular, in the current culture, I'm the Lord. Bring it on. Is anything too hard? Now, there are some things that we give to God, but if we're not careful, there's some things we take from God. Lord, you must heal this disease. We can't do anything, but Lord, I can provide for this bill. Lord, you do this, but I'll do this. Lord, I need your help. I'm strung with this. God, no one but you can help me. But I can go through this day and work just fine without you. I get up in the morning without you. I get ready without you. I drive to work without you. I do my job all day without you, and I do a pretty good job at it without you. My back, my boss thinks I'm a real good worker, and I didn't use you all day. I drive home without you, 
I spend time with my family without you. I go to bed without you. And then I wonder why I don't have a life of faith. Because I'm not walking in his strength. I'm walking in my strength. We must believe that God is. God is what? That God is my strength for today. Lord, when I wake up, I need you. You said in your word, without you, I can do nothing. Lord, I need you today. Lord, I'm going to drive to work, but I need your protection on the way to work. Lord, help me as I drive to work. Oh, that's silly, Pastor Howell. Do you need the Lord driving to work? You better believe I do. So do you. You ever have one of those near crash experiences? I have. They wake you up in those moments. I told you a couple weeks, maybe two weeks ago now, we're driving back. On a, from a men's prayer meeting, Johnny and I, and a deer jumped right in front of us. I've hit more deer than anyone else in my family. I've never shot a deer out hunting, but I've hit them. I've got plenty of deer in my life. I, I never hit them hard enough, I guess, to kill them. They always run off. But boy, it, that happens. And, and it's like in a moment, you realize how quick life and how fragile life is. Wow. And that's just driving to work. Beyond that, I've driven to work before, and I bet you have too, where you get there and you don't know how you got there. You've done that before? Your mind was somewhere else? Come on, anybody else like that? You got there? Boy, that's not dangerous for everyone else. <laughs> Man, when I, my time when I was out running, I would watch for people on their cell phones. They're driving down the road. You can see them as they're coming. They're veering all over the place like this. I'm like, Lord, I'm not sure it's my time to die. Just make sure it's not their time either. You know, don't want to be an innocent bystander in this. I need his strength. And that's just for driving to work. I need his strength while I'm at work. I need his strength in my family. I'm I'm flesh and blood. If I raise my kids, if I treat my wife like my flesh, I'm going to mess it all up. I need his strength. Oh, we bring the Lord back in. We come to church. Lord, help the service. Lord, bless this day now. Or here's, here's the worst part. The only time we bring him to life, to our life, is right before we eat. Now, I've never eaten with some of your cooking, so maybe you do need to pray before you eat. But isn't that, isn't that shameful? That that's, the, that's, for some of us, the first time we pray is before we eat. Before we're about to fill our faces with food, then we introduce God to the equation. Lord, thank you for this food. My goodness. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. Faith is believing that he is and living in that reality, the reality of his strength. Say, Lord, I need you. I need you all day long. I need you when I wake up. I need you when I go to sleep. I need you when I drive. Lord, I need you when I eat. I need you when I work. I need you with my wife. I need you with my husband. I need you with my kids. Lord, I need you with my neighbors. I need you. And Lord, I rest in your strength. Lord, help me. Lord, help me to say those things that will please you. Lord, help me to react the way you want me to react. Lord, I'm going to Walmart. Help me to spend money on what I ought to spend money on. Boy, it's a radical change. Pray before you go to Walmart, living in light of his strength. We too often, we do our things, and we tell him His thanks. Lord, I've got this sickness. Okay, your turn. Your turn, Lord. I did my things. You do your things. No, it's all his things. And our life must be lived that it's all his things. We live in the reality of his sovereignty, live in the reality of his strength. But this morning, we must live in the reality of his supply. I could talk about the provision of God as far as material things but I don't think we need that this morning I want to give us three things that God supplies to us that we must live by faith in three things number one our time God supplies us with time 24 hours in a day not a second more not a second less you don't get more than me I don't get more than you We get the same time in the day. Now, our lives may be different, but the Bible says this, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You know what I see in this chapter? When these men and women were walking by faith, they were using the time that God gave them to please him. 
Listen, are you using the time to please the Lord? Are you using the time in your life to walk by faith? Are you wasting time? He gives us the time we need. He gives us the trials we need. James says this, my brother, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. He gives us the truth that we need. In our cells, in our body. They tell me there's a special place that oxygen is supposed to go into. And every time that you take a breath, that oxygen connects to your cells, runs through your body, and supplies your body with the oxygen that it needs. It's shaped just perfectly to hold the atom of oxygen. But funny thing, there's another chemical that's almost the same characteristics, just slightly different. It's called carbon monoxide. You've maybe heard the stories of people who had a furnace in their house with carbon monoxide. And falling asleep, and if help doesn't come, they pass away. The problem with carbon monoxide is a person can be standing there. They can be opening their mouth. They can be taking in lungfuls of this substance that they think are, is oxygen. But it's not. It's not sustaining them. It's not uplifting them. It's not giving them strength. It's not really what they need. And they don't even realize that instead of breathing life-giving oxygen, they are breathing life-taking carbon monoxide. If help doesn't come, eventually your body's oxygen content will be replaced by carbon monoxide. And they say that you can be suffocating with that and not even know it. You see, we're supposed to walk by faith. Faith in God is that life breathed into us. God is strength. God's in charge. God supplies. I take that breath in faith and I follow him. But if we're not careful, if we're not cautious... If we're not on guard, we will begin to replace our faith in God with something else. And we'll be taking these breaths and wonder why we feel suffocated inside. Why life stinks. Why everyone else gets all the blessings. Why their prayers are answered. Why they have joy and I'm just sour and and life stinks and it's just, oh. Because I'm neglecting, I'm neglecting the one thing that makes it possible to solve the impossible, and that's please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. I wonder this morning, my friend, if you're living in the reality that God is. Not if you know that he is. Not if you can talk about how he is. As they say, talk is cheap. But if you were to look at your life, if God were to look at your life, if we were to look at your life, if we would see choices, decisions, thoughts of faith, we can walk by faith or we can reject the faith. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning, challenge us, Lord. Lord, as we look at you, we see your power, we see your strength, we see your supply. And Lord, I ask you to help us to search our hearts this morning. Lord, maybe be honest about if we're truly not just giving you lip service, Lord, but if we're walking in faith in our life. If truly we rely on your strength, if we're okay with what you do. 
wonder if you're here this morning. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? As you spoke, God spoke to me. And maybe I know all the right answers. Maybe you know all the right answers. Maybe you can quote the verses. But when God spoke to you, he touched an area and said, listen, in this area, you're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight. You're walking in your own strength. You're following something else. One of you this morning say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up, slip back down? I'll see it. I'll nod it. Amen. 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 Hands all over. Who else? That's me, Pastor. As you spoke, God spoke to me. In just a moment. Stand for an invitation. I encourage you to come. Make a decision. And with God's help, you'll walk in faith. One of you here this morning, and maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't know that if you died, you'd go to heaven. You've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. If you died, you're not sure you'd go to heaven. My friend, I'd love to pray for you when I pray for the others. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But I wonder if you'd say, Pastor... When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? I, there's something going on in my heart. I, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? My friend, would you just slip your hand up? I'm the only one looking around up here. But I'd love to pray for you. Would you be honest? That's me. I'm not sure. I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip it up, slip back down, and we'll see it. I'm not sure. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, you know our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd help us to respond to you the way we ought to. Lord, may we make a decision to walk in faith and not by sight or anything else. Lord, bless this time of invitation now. In Jesus' name, amen.